Okay, I think we're uh, ready to get started. Okay, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Matt Radishansky. I'm um, a member of the Mentor Embedded Software um, Marketing Team. I'm located here in uh, Chile, Portland, Oregon. Um, today's event is titled uh, Vehicular Networking, Technology, Business, and Regulation of the Connected Car. Thanks again for joining us. Uh, we'd like this event to be as interactive as possible. Uh, so please feel free to use the commenting section that's playing below the YouTube feed here to enter in any comments or questions or, or thoughts you might have, and we'll do our best to address them uh, real time during this Hangout. Um, the, uh, we've also allocated some time at the end for Q&A too, so if you'd prefer to hold your questions until then, uh, that's fine also. Joining me today for this presentation are Allison Chaikin and John, Dr. John Kinney. Um, Allison's automotive technical work began with Mego IVI at Nokia and is focused on focused at Mentor on Linux kernel for Freescale i.MX6. MX6. Allison is a co-author of an IETF draft standard on geo networking and previously gave presentations about the automotive internet at the 2013 Embedded Linux Conference and the 2013 Automotive Linux Summit. She comes into contact with Bay Area IVI innovators as the organizer of a 900 plus member silicon automotive open source group and is a technical member of our Mentor Embedded software team. John is a principal researcher at the Toyota Info Technology Center in Mountain View, California. Uh, John leads a vehicular networking research team. He represents Toyota in cooperative projects between the Vehicle Safety Communications Consortium and the US Department of Transportation. He also represents Toyota and DSRC-related standards groups at IEEE, SAE, and ETSI. Uh, once again, we're encouraging some interaction for this, so please feel free to enter in your questions or comments below the, uh, the live YouTube stream, and, and we'll address them as best we can. Uh, following this presentation, the, live, um, the recording of this live YouTube feed will be available on this event page uh, right here. Uh, and we'll also post links to the slides that Allison and, and John are about to share. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Allison Chaikin and John Kenny. So I'll pass it off to you guys. Thanks very much, Matt. I hope everybody can hear me. Let me bring up those slides here. Hopefully now you guys can see them. So thanks everyone for joining us, whether it's 8 a.m. on the frosty west coast of the United States or whether we're keeping you from your Christmas market in Central Europe. So let's get right down to business. What I'm going to talk about this morning is some of the underlying uh, technology and uh, business activities of what's been called the connected car. Uh, Lauren Fix of carcoach.com suggests smart car is better. I'm also going to focus more on safety and traffic management that are really the early drivers for the type of car communications innovation that we'll be talking about, much more than the streaming media or pushing Facebook updates to the car that have gotten a little bit more publicity. There are any number of connection modalities that can be used for automotive. Uh, just as there are in any other domain. Um, but automotive has some special requirements that we're going to describe for you. So in addition to LTE and uh, SMS and satellite, which is already uh, has a large install base in cars, there are new standards like 802.11p, which is Wi-Fi, like the 802.11a and b and n that people are using every day with their laptops and their mobile phones but has some different aspects. Uh, after I give this brief introduction, John will dive right into some of the uh, details of these protocols and the specific spectrum allocation that goes with them and describe the security and scalability challenges that automotive networking presents that are a little bit different than what you might be used to thinking about for other applications. Then I'll return and talk about some very exciting, uh, fairly significant pilot projects in the US and Europe 
that demonstrate real government interest uh, and investment in these technologies. I'll make the whole subject a little bit more concrete by talking about some examples of specific hardware and software that are available and give you a little flavor for what the immediate prospects for the technology are. So with that, uh, let's get into the terminology first so we're all uh, understanding each other. Um, common terms that are used in the discussion of this technical domain are vehicle to vehicle, it's pretty obvious what that means, called V to V. V to I, which means communication of vehicles to uh, possibly uh, traffic units like uh, toll booths or traffic lights, but also uh, possibly just repeaters. Um, and some of these infrastructure units may be uh, traditional access points, and some of them may be different, and John is going to discuss a lot more details there. Um, the radios that are in cars in North America tend to be called uh, onboard units, OBUs. They're called vehicle stations typically in European uh, uh, standards. Uh, we have roadside units in the US and we have roadside stations in Europe. Uh, a major source of confusion, even sometimes among workers in the field, is that the term dedicated short-range communication, DSRC, means quite different things in European and U.S. contexts. So uh, here's something uh, useful for you to take away um, in the future. There's something called CEN, DSRC in Europe. That means toll collection uh, at uh, highway uh, stations, uh, similar to what we call fast track here in California. But in the U.S., it's a, a and in uh, IEEE standards, it's a safety protocol. So uh, John will be talking about TSRC, but he does not mean toll collection, which is a rather limited, uninspiring application, I think we'll agree. So I want to get right into what are some particular use cases so the discussion isn't too abstract. Why do we care about vehicular internetworking, and why is it different than uh, watching a video over Wi-Fi, and why does it need different standards? So here I've just stolen a slide from NXP, which is a major participant in this area. Um, they just give some examples uh, that make clear why the technology is useful. Um, if you consider two vehicles talking to each other, uh, a following vehicle could, for example, learn from a vehicle in front of it that the road ahead is flooded. Uh, or a vehicle in front could uh, say that it struck a pothole. Uh, emergency vehicles don't have to rely on audible sirens. Uh, they potentially can send messages to cars. Um, and there are lots of cases that are contemplated, for example, with vehicle to infrastructure, where, for example, a roadside unit could inform a vehicle that it's approaching a curve too quickly or that a speed limit has temporarily been reduced. So once you start thinking about applications, it's easy to come up with many, many of them. And there are a lot of interesting papers that I can point you to that discuss these uh, matters in detail. Uh, I did put a lot of hyperlinks into this talk right now. Unfortunately, this version with all the reformatting we've done, they're broken. But I promise that there are a lot of hyperlinks with reference material in the slides that we post on the website at the end. Uh, if you really can't find any of this information, feel free to contact me on Google Plus or some other place. So to me, as a driver, the application of car-to-car -car connectivity and car -to, uh, infrastructure connectivity that I really, really want is Greenlight Optimal Speed Advisory. I'd be willing to put down some cash for this right now. The idea of Greenlight Optimal Speed Advisory is that uh, roadside units can inform vehicles what the optimal speed to pick with their cruise control is so that drivers nearly never hit a red light. So if you can imagine going on a street near you that has many traffic lights, uh, if the essentially the traffic lights informed you that you could adjust your speed just a little bit and go through on green, that would make my life a lot less tedious. I, I think that would be great. And this is quite possible with existing technologies. Um, 
and it wouldn't have to be on every road in order to be a real benefit. So you can see, just thinking a little bit about these examples, that auto uh, networks are quite different than uh, traditional uses of Wi-Fi or, or other networking technologies in that the important aspects are reliability and latency. Uh, it's not very useful getting a message from a traffic light what my optimal speed is if I get the message after I'm already sitting at the red light. And uh, in the same way, another, another method of stating the same point is that traditionally in networking we think of the overall data rate uh, as being a measure of the quality of service. But that's really not true here. It really is getting messages promptly and for safety messages in particular reliably. And, and so the other aspect that's a little bit uh, may make your head hurt in, in regards to thinking about the automotive networking is I don't really want to hog the channel and send my Twitter updates if I'm going to miss a message that uh, a car in front of me has uh, crashed and is blocking my lane. I'd rather get the message from the other vehicle, uh, just as I'd rather get the uh, message from the traffic light about when it's going to change. So the reason for new standards, in essence, is that these needs really are different than traditional Wi-Fi uh, connectivity. The really, automotive use case really is unique and uh, has really driven the creation of new standards that John is going to describe in detail in just a moment. Now, nonetheless, uh, you have to believe that LTE is going to push data to cars for matters like weather updates and um, you know, traffic information as far as uh, traffic far ahead on your route. There's no reason not to push that data with LTE. That data it does not have a, a latency and reliability requirement like the other types of messages I was just discussing. There's also a very interesting uh, business activity around what we call terrestrial, uh, namely traditional AM and FM radio, and also satellite radio. So for example, Sirius, uh, a company with which many of you will be familiar, a satellite radio company, has recently purchased a JIRO, a major provider of automotive backhaul. And so uh, it is very interesting that the Automotive networking, uh, you know, has a significant backhaul component. Um, another uh, quite intriguing deal is that Nokia here, which is uh, Nokia's maps uh, business, has announced a deal with Ubiquity to push data over HD radio, which is essentially the sideband in terrestrial radio, um, particularly in places where connectivity is not very good. Uh, you can easily imagine in rural areas that they're not going to be roadside units anytime soon. So maybe getting updates via satellite or a terrestrial broadcast sidebands would be a method of, of rolling out these technologies over a larger geographic area. And in fact, the pilots that I'll be talking about uh, more towards the end of the talk are already using UTMS, uh, UMTS, the 3G data uh, method. And in fact, um, the telephone companies are investing heavily in Vita X technologies because they foresee this area as a major growth opportunity for them. So that's essentially enough of my talking about um, uh, the motivation. Uh, I did want to remind you a little bit about what is going on in networking, how networking works in general. So here's a photo, that, an image that I stole from Wikipedia about what's called the OSI model. It's a traditional method of thinking about networks that applies to any network. And the startling point about automotive and intelligent transportation as far as networking is that we're really needing to change all the layers of this stack. Um, John will be talking principally about the, what we call the phi, which is the things like the spectrum. Um, in tr traditionally, we expect in networking the most common solutions like uh, Ethernet in layer two, uh, IP in layer three, and either TCP or UDP in layer four. Um, but in fact, we really need for low latency 
low uh, data rate, high reliability communications where vehicles are moving at high speeds to change all four of these layers. And then in, in addition, as uh, Matt mentioned in the introduction, I'm involved with a group that uh, at IETF that's discussing geo-networking, which could potentially be, for example, uh, LAT-LAN location-based extensions to DNS uh, for routing. So there's a lot of activity in all these different uh, layers of the OSI stack, and John is uh, now going to give you some actual technical meat uh, about what those discussions are. I'm going to turn it over to you now, John. Great. Um, thanks, Allison. So um, hopefully, it, since I started talking, the, uh, the the view has switched over to the slides on my laptop, um, and I'll go forward. Yeah, we, uh, we can see you, John. You're good. Great. Thanks, Matt. So, um, so having just looked at the the OSI um, template of layers, let's look at what the uh, the stack, the protocol stack for DSRC in the U.S. looks like, and and in Europe. Um, for what they call cooperative ITS, it's it's uh, somewhat similar. Um, so we had, uh, these different uh, boxes that are shaded in different uh, with different forms of green represent the things that were designed specifically for DSRC. Um, and as you can see, once you get above the the Mac layer, the the Phi and the Mac, you have a choice of either using these newer DSRC specific or DSRC purpose built protocols over on the left, or you can use traditional internet protocols, IPv6 with TCP or UDP or whatever your favorite transport layer protocol is on the right. Either one of those is permitted. Um, so let me just, uh, before I go on, let me just say that if, if you're interested in, in a lot of detail about these, these protocols and standards, there's a reference to a paper there at the bottom of slide nine. So let's talk about, um, Let's talk about them very briefly. Uh, what kind of sets the ones that were designed for DSRC apart from, from other networking protocols? With regard to the 802.11p amendment to the, the, the regular 802.11 Wi-Fi standard, uh, one of the things we attempted to do was change as little as possible because we wanted to leverage the vast economies of scale that come with Wi-Fi. They're selling billions of chips a year, and we're going to sell, you know, we're going to sell maybe tens of millions of chips per year. Um, so we wanted to hop on that bandwagon as much as we could. That's one of the reasons we chose to make it Wi-Fi based. But an important difference is how we interact with each other in a local area networking sense. So you may be familiar with 802.11 uh, and its basic service set concept. The basic service set is the wireless LAN in which uh, a client talks to an access point, and it has to go through these three steps shown in the upper part of the slide before it can, before it can, it can begin to communicate. First it goes through an authentication step and then an association step, and after several seconds typically, then it can finally exchange data. That kind of delay to, um, to the data exchange was really not acceptable for the highly mobile vehicular environment. So, um, the main change we did in 802.11p was to allow data communication without going through authentication and association. That meant that we're not using the basic service set concept. So what we added has, been co has come to be called communication outside the context of a basic service set, or OCB. If you're interested in finding the 802.11p portions of this massive 802.11 2700-page standard, the best thing to do is to search for the string OCB, and you'll find most of the places where we made changes. Just to in introduce another uh, part of our terminology, the standards that have come out of 802.11p and the 1609 working group, the, the middle layers, are all called WAVE standards, or WAVE stands for wireless, wireless access in a particular environment. So in some ways, WAVE and DSRC in the U.S. are, are synonymous, but um, I, I tend to use them fairly interchangeably, especially if I'm trying to avoid the confusion with DSRC that Allison mentioned earlier, since it has a different meaning in Europe. Okay, so that's the that's the Phi and Mac layer. Um, if we go up to the network and transport layer, you have two choices. You can either use the purpose-built WAVE short message protocol, or you can use the traditional internet protocols, as we mentioned. The, the short message protocol, WSMP, 
has the advantage of being very lightweight. The, the standard header is only five bytes. Um, one of the reasons it's so short is that we aren't doing any routing with this protocol. It doesn't need any addressing information. Um, it just needs to be able to, to uh, indicate a few pieces of protocol information and essentially a destination port that the receiver uses to route the data to the proper upper layer process. For many of our DSOC applications, we want to disseminate information on a one-hop broadcast basis. And for those purposes, this is entirely adequate. And we prefer to avoid the overhead of using IP, uh, especially IPv6. Uh, so we have five bytes instead of, you know, it's an order of magnitude saving compared to the internet protocols. And, and as I say, for many of our applications, that's, that's a better choice. Continuing in kind of the middle layers, um, Another protocol that came out of the 1609 working group addresses security. Um, some of the security needs are a little bit un uh, unique for, uh, for wireless environment. And also, as, as I said earlier, we're skipping the authentication step at 802.11, so we needed to add some capabilities higher up. The two primary functions that the 1609.2 protocol, or excuse me, standard, uh, defines are authentication and encryption algorithms. So if you want to uh, be able to authenticate a message by providing a digital signature and attaching a certificate. Uh, the receiver of that message can validate that the signature goes with the certificate, and therefore the sender was authorized to send, and also that no corruption of the data has happened since the, uh, since the uh, sender composed the message. If you want to keep the data secret, um, you can use encryption as well. For our single hop broadcast type applications, we don't do that because we want any, they're intended for to be consumed by any, any device that's within range and can hear it and, and, and parse it. But there could be applications like tolling and other kinds of uh, payments where you'd want to encrypt the data, certainly. The, the other note I wanted to add about privacy is that, or excuse me, about security is that privacy is an important dimension of this as well. Um, the paradigm for DSRC safety is that each vehicle sends out a message uh, frequently that gives information about where the vehicle is and where it's headed. And uh, we wanted to make sure that that kind of information is not, direct, is not connected to any particular identifiable vehicle or driver. Uh, in other words, we wanted these messages to be um, anonymous. And so uh, we took some, some significant steps to, to achieve that anonymity. Um, we don't want someone to be able to track your movements because uh, these safety messages are being sent. We don't want uh, we don't want someone to get a, a speeding ticket in the mail because they their car advertised they were going at a certain speed. So this anonymity um, uh, makes that uh, makes that privacy work. Um, and we can say more privacy about privacy if there are questions later. Continuing on up the stack, then, at the higher layers, we, um, we turn the standardization over to SAE, which is a more automotive-oriented standards organization. And uh, this basic safety message that I was just referring to that is exchanged among vehicles, here's a high-level look at the kind of information that goes into it. So you tell the other vehicle where you are, how fast you're going, what your acceleration is, and other information like are you using your brakes, is your stability control engaged, how big is your vehicle, and, and so forth. Some of the information is only included as needed or uh, may not be included in every message because it, it's a, it takes a lot of uh, bits to, to advertise, like the path history. But most of the information will be in each and every um, basic safety message, which again, these are sent frequently several times per second, and we send them with enough power to have them disseminated over a range of a few hundred meters. Okay, so that's a brief look at the stack. Now, as, as I want to move now into what some of the challenges are that we're looking at, but before I do that, I want to point out that we've actually made huge amounts of progress over the last um, eight to ten years in the research phase of this project. We achieved all of these things. The standards um, are almost entirely uh, complete and mature, and, and Allison's going to talk about a trial that happened in Michigan uh, that really proved that out. The fact that, that devices from different suppliers were interoperating uh, easily was a good vote of confidence for our standards. And I also wanted to mention that the challenges we face are not only technical, but they also live in these other domains, policy and business and, and governance. And the U.S. Department of Transportation is, is well aware of that. And they have 
they have initiatives, uh, parallel initiatives addressing all of these things. I'm, I tend to live in the technical part of this, so that's, that's what this talk is focusing on. But those other things are important, and they all interact with each other. So to talk about what we're, what we're looking at more in, in the, current, uh, the current research environment, I'm just going to mention very briefly a word about security, a word about positioning, and a word about scalability. With regard to security, I, I described at a high level how authentication works. Um, that authentication can be applied to basic safety messages or to other types of messages like those that intersection devices will send. Um, and and that, that part of the protocol is, is pretty well understood. But there's a, there's a back end to the security system as well, and we need to, we need to define what the roles of that are, what the back, what the back end's role is. I, I'm labeling that certificate authority here, but it really has uh, a number of different pieces to it. And um, what are those roles? And importantly, how will the car interact with, with the infrastructure, the security infrastructure? It will need to do that so that from time to time it can be replenished with new credentials. It will also need to do that if it encounters uh, someone who is sending out misbehavior messages, by which we mean um, things that have a valid signature, but the content has been altered to, for example, um, indicate the presence of a car that doesn't really exist, what we call a ghost vehicle. Um, when that's detected, it, it's helpful to be able to report that back to a central authority so that if it looks like a recurring problem, the uh, certificates, those credentials that uh, that hacker is using, that attacker is using, or even even somebody who just has misbehaving um, misbehaving sensors and it's unintentionally sending this bad information. But those those credentials can be revoked so that other vehicles know not to give credit to messages received from that sender. So we're, we're still working out some of the details of this security infrastructure communication, but it, it's, it's all already well underway, and, uh, and a version of that has been trialed in Michigan. With regard to positioning, uh, obviously, we, we all know about DPS and, and, uh, and that it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing new capability that, to tell us where we are, but we also know that it doesn't always know exactly where we are. With the precision with which it knows where we are is quite important, especially when we're talking about using this, um, this V2V safety um, communication capability to prevent collisions. We really need a fair amount of precision for that. So the, the positioning challenge is really just to get uh, those devices working better and better, find ways to augment them when maybe the, uh, the satellite views are, are not as many as we would like, um, through some sort of uh, infrastructure relays uh, or, or uh, differential corrections or, or those sorts of things. But what we found in our research uh, in, the, in the U.S. automotive industry is that the positioning, that, 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 it, that there, is a, there exists today positioning equipment that is, in fact, entirely adequate for us to get the precision we need to, to prevent collisions. So now it's a matter of refining that and making it cheaper and, and getting it into the car. And then the third of the challenges I wanted to mention is the scalability challenge, which this picture kind of illustrates, you know, the, the basis of the question. It, you know, it's fine if we say it works when we have two or three vehicles in a, in a parking lot, and, and it's fine if we say it works in a lab environment. What's going to happen when it's put into this kind of environment where there are hundreds of cars within a communication range of, of you? Um, when we think about scalability, there are different dimensions of that. There's one that has to do with the processing resource. How many of incoming messages can I um, can I receive and, and parse and assess the threat of? Um, how about this authentication procedure? It, that takes a lot of uh, processing resource. So can I can I authenticate all the messages that are coming in, or do I have to be selective about which ones I authenticate? There's there's scalability with regard to the bandwidth on the channel. And there's scalability with regard to how big and complicated that security infrastructure back end is that I was just describing. But out of all of those, the, the channel uh, resource is the one that is, in some sense, most precious because we can't just buy more of that. We can, we can spend money and, and address the other aspects of, of, re, uh, of scalability, but um, we, we tend to spend most of our time talking about channel congestion because that there's really nothing we can do, as I said, to, to get more of that capacity. But I'm not going to say more about how we do that, but I'll just mention that we at Toyota 
Info Technology Center are, uh, are actively involved in researching that topic, as are other uh, researchers from other car makers. And we we're working together to try to come up with uh, the best solutions, both here and in Europe. Uh, so this is a very active area of research and testing right now. So from there, I'd like to transition into um, a, a brief discussion about the spectrum for DSRC in the U.S. Um, and an issue that's arisen recently um, regarding that. So, uh, back hey, in hey, John, before we uh, before we jump into that, yeah. uh, we did get a question come in from uh, Jonathan Petit. Um, it seems that the C2C-CC will not perform revocation for pseudonyms because of the short lifetime of these credentials. Therefore, CRL distrib distribution and size will not be an issue. What do you think about this approach? Yeah, so thanks, Jonathan, for the question. Um, so the C2C CC is the Car-to-Car -car Communications Consortium, which is a consortium of automakers and suppliers in Europe who are working with the standards organizations there to um, develop the, the, um, the parameters of the system that they will begin deploying, uh, perhaps as, as early as 2015. Um, and, uh, and, and so I, I described the 1609.2 security standard that we're using here in the U.S. and in C to CCC and, and in Etsy, the European Standards Organization, um, they're developing security protocols and standards there as well. They're largely aligned with each other. The 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 1609.2 approach was was adopted uh, largely unchanged, but there are a few there are a few differences. And, and um, this lack of, of um, CRL, uh, the certificate revocation list, is one of those differences. Um, I I I think that they have a uh, so the, I don't I don't know the precise answer actually, Jonathan, to to the reason why. We are, we've decided to use CRLs, and, and in Europe they're not. But I know that there are slight differences in how they plan to manage their certificates and, um, and how often they plan to replenish them. Um, so it may be that, uh, it, it may be that, they, that they think that the value of re revocation is not worth the trouble in terms of, of spending bandwidth and processing and trying to disseminate that information. Um, because the certificates all have lifetimes and they expire, and so even if one is is being used in a misbehaving way, its its ability to be used for that has a limited duration. Um, we, at least in the U.S., we're we're planning to provide a vehicle with uh, maybe as many as three years worth of certificates that are all kind of linked together, um, and so we're concerned that if an attacker gets access to those credentials, they could keep uh, attacking. By swapping credentials for uh, is for quite a long time, and so that's where we, why we thought the revocation list was was worth spending the effort on. So that that's that's what I know about that. Um, I'll I'll keep going then and and talk about the spectrum issue. So in the U.S., we have allocated we have been allocated 75 megahertz of spectrum from the FCC, which controls uh, allocations here. And uh, that's organized in, as shown on this slide. There's a, there's a reserved 5 megahertz at the bottom, but the main organization of the band plan is 10 megahertz wide channels, of which we have seven. And three of those seven have special uses designated uh, in the FCC regulations, as shown here with these arrows. The other four would be used uh, for other advanced things in the future that we haven't yet um, begun developing, like uh, Communication to support automated driving, for example. But it can also be used for some more generic DSRC services, um, like uh, uh, the speed limit advisory or or uh, work zone advisory or uh, some of the other things that Allison mentioned earlier. So this all we call this the 5.9 gigahertz band. It spans 5850 to 5925, and the spectrum issue that's come up recently is that. Um, as many of you probably know already, the, the because of the wide success of Wi-Fi, um, it is it, it's facing a, a shortage shortage of spectrum to be able to use um, in public places, especially. So um, so there's been a push supported by fairly widely by people in the U.S. government and of course from the Wi-Fi industry to allow Wi-Fi devices to operate on an unlicensed basis in new parts of spectrum. 
and that includes parts of the 5 gigahertz spectrum, but also other areas like the 3 gigahertz spectrum. What's happened recently is that there's been a specific discussion about whether unlicensed devices could begin using spectrum in the 5 gigahertz area. And what this uh, slide shows right now is how that might be used by Wi-Fi devices. If, if they were allowed to use channels across the whole 5 gigahertz spectrum, this is what it would look like. Those that are colored in, um, in a blue tint um, are already, they're already allowed to use these bands. Those that are red are in bands that they are not currently allowed to use, but would be permitted to use if the rules change. And with the advent of the newest form of Wi-Fi, 11AC it's called, they're using 80 and 160 megahertz channels. And so one of the one of the metrics that they're using to determine whether it would be useful to go into a new band is how many more 80 and how many more 160 megahertz channels can I get if I do that. So from this mapping, you can see that down in the 5.3 gig range, they could get two new 80s and one new 160. Up in the 5.9 gigahertz band where we are, oh, excuse me, um, they could get one new 80 and one new 150. So they're motivated to try to find ways to do this to do this operation. But the rules say that they can only operate in a band where there's a primary user. They can only operate if they don't harmfully interfere with that primary user's communication. So in the context of DSRC, um, you know that means not delaying our messages or not uh, transmitting over the top of them so that they're lost. Here's a, a, a timeline with some of the events that have push this issue to the fore. Um, going back a few years, we, we saw discussions about the need for a new spectrum, and we saw data showing that it was, was needed. But the most important kickoff to this, and I'm using my cursor, I hope you can see it, is that in February of 2012, there was a new law. Congress got involved, and they directed the FCC to look specifically at opening up the 5.3 gig Band, and they asked this other uh, organization within the Department of Commerce called NTIA to study the feasibility of opening up the 5.9 gigahertz band. But NTIA came back in January of this year with a report that talked about um, the possibilities but also risks associated with unlicensed devices going into 5.9 gigahertz. And then the next month um, in February, down here, the FCC issued what's called a notice of proposed rulemaking. And this notice of proposed rulemaking touches the entire 5 gigahertz band. So they have sections about changing rules in 5.1 and 5.2. They have sections talking about opening up 5.3 and so on. And then they have a section talking about uh, asking the question, really, is, is sharing feasible between um, Wi-Fi devices in particular and, uh, and vehicles using DSRC? And they... And, and several stakeholders from both sides have been commenting on that. The progression was that the automotive industry and the DSRC, uh, excuse me, the automotive industry and the Wi-Fi industry kind of reached out to each other and said, let's talk about how we can address this from a technical perspective, see if there is a solution that we can both agree to. And so there were meetings held uh, in the May and June time frame to, uh, to get that kicked off, and that led to the formation of what's called the Tiger Team inside of 802.11. This Tiger Team's mission is to develop technical sharing solutions so that Wi-Fi can use a band in a way that can guarantee no harmful interference to DSRC. Um, so that this is open to anybody who wants to participate. Um, I'm, I regularly do. Um, and in the meantime, uh, the auto group has been also talking with people inside the government. We met with the FCC and with uh, the White House Science Office in September. And Congress is getting back involved and asking some questions. And so I had the opportunity to testify at a congressional subcommittee hearing in November, along with people from Comcast and Cisco and from the FCC, about the 5 gigahertz band and what's going on there. Um, so where is that going to go? Um, well. We're looking for solutions, and there's, so far there are two that have been put on the table. I'm going to talk about one of them at a very high level, which I call the detect and vacate concept. The other one um, has more to do with the DSRC uh, band being reshuffled so that uh, there's perhaps a reduced competition between our most critical traffic and the Wi-Fi traffic. But um, uh, let me talk about this detect and vacate. So as I said, the key is to avoid um, 
the Wi-Fi packets either delaying or colliding with the DSRC packets. And one of the one of the things that we have going for us is that DSRC is already part of the Wi-Fi family, as we said. It comes from the 802.11 uh, standard. And, and as you probably know, Wi-Fi uses a medium access control protocol that has a listen before talk feature, the CSMA CA um, protocol. So, uh, so the gist of this um, detect and vacate is that that Wi-Fi devices would use their capability of listening, bef listening for um, other packets to not only uh, try to figure out when the channel is busy and idle, that's its normal function, but also to figure out if it's busy because it's being used by a DSRC transmitter. If, if the, uh, the Wi-Fi device can detect that what it's hearing right now is a DSRC packet signature, then it can go into a special mode to say, oh, okay, this is, a DSR, this is an area where DSRC systems are active in the 5.9 gigahertz band. I shouldn't be using this for Wi-Fi. I should either go to another band or I should just be quiet until I don't hear DSRC. So um, that, that's why we call it detect and vacate. They're always listening for DSRC. When they hear it, they stop using the band for some to be determined length of time. Um, it could be on the order of tens of seconds. It could be uh, on the order of a minute. It's not going to likely be a half hour like it is when they have when they detect a radar and have to go away. Um, so the length of time is is something still to be discussed. But the good news for the the reason that the automotive people are 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 um, encouraged about the possibilities of this concept and, and many details would still need to be proven out. But we're encouraged because this, this looks like it could be uh, leveraging the, the existing 802.11 detection capability in a way that should be attractive for Wi-Fi vendors. They don't have to invent new detection uh, modules. They already know how to do this. And, um, and it, would be, it would be have them acting in what I would call a polite way. It is when, when, they're de when they detect DSRC, they don't try to compete with us. They just simply stop using the channel until they're, until they're confident there's no DSRC present. So there's a reference here uh, to a IEEE 802.11 document that, that talks about this concept in more detail. I also put a reference uh, to a paper on the bottom of the page that's going to be um, presented next week at the uh, Vehicular Networking Conference in Boston that lays out uh, more of the story of this um, and uh, more of the story of the whole spectrum sharing issue and also talks a little bit about this detect and vacate uh, concept. So with that, um, I'm at the end of my phase, and I will uh, be happy to turn it back over to you, Allison. Thanks very much, John. I'm going to try to reshare my slides here. And hopefully you can now see the slide advance. Did that work? So Yeah, I'm, it works fine. Thanks, Allison. Great. So I'm going to try to put a little bit of meat on the bones and uh, help you picture the actual business and technology uh, activity that's going on uh, and talk a little bit more about opportunities for small businesses, for students, um, for uh, automakers and their uh, ecosystems to participate. So uh, first of all, I wanted to describe the actual 802.11p hardware you can get. Uh, John alluded to the fact that 802.11p uses a different channel width. Uh, 802.11p is actually also allowed to use a higher broadcast power uh, than Wi-Fi traditionally does. There's a long list of uh, manufacturers who make various kinds of hardware. Some of these manufacturers are making what we were calling onboard units. Some are making roadside units. Uh, some are providing system integration, and uh, some are just making the chips. I realized, uh, looking at this list this morning, that since I talked about the Theros on the next slide, I should have put Broadcom on here, but I overlooked that. Um, the case of Componentality, which is a uh, Finnish-Russian company, is particularly interesting because they are uh, starting an open source project called OpenWave, or a flex road uh, and its two uh, different uh, source trees that will implement the 1609 uh, wave stack that John was just speaking about. 
So Componentality is actively seeking collaborators. And uh, I promise that when uh, the final version of these slides goes up, that all the hyperlinks to uh, places to contact people uh, are restored. So um, here's an example of a card you could get started with if you want to play in this area. Unix, which is a tiny Taiwanese company, makes a mini PCI 802.11p radio. But it really should be said that you could uh, change the device driver for an 802.11 ABGN uh, card and uh, you know, implement the uh, half uh, width channels and the slightly different handshaking. So um, you could actually send uh, these wave type communications over regular Wi-Fi too. Uh, um, so unfortunately, there's no in-kernel driver in Linux for 802.11p Comsignia does have a uh, BSD, uh, some BSD software. Um, some of these names will, are kind of usual suspects for uh, networking. Uh, CUDA is a very interesting Australian company with which both Cisco and NXP have partnerships. Uh, Savari is a San Jose based company right close to me here in California that has worked a lot in Safety Pilot that I'll talk about in a moment. CAPTCH, I think, may be the uh, largest incumbent in this field. They're heavily involved in SIMTD, the German pilot that I'm going to describe. And uh, Denso and Delphi also have large efforts. So um, there really is a huge amount of business activity in this space. Uh, just to talk a little bit more about the software aspect, here is a slide from a uh, report about ITS for commercial uh, transportation. In fact, uh, agriculture and uh, commercial vehicles or, and transit vehicles probably will be the early adopters and test boats for a lot of this technology. Uh, the 802.11p chipsets are made by the Theros Relink and, and uh, uh, Coda NXP. And they uh, obviously are deployed in the, what we're calling the onboard units, the roadside units, and connecting to uh, perhaps to the wider internet through traditional means. And so uh, it's not surprising, I think, if you know anything about the history of routing in Linux, to learn that a lot of these devices are running OpenWRT, which is uh, a software stack that you can run on your own little Linksys router, for example. So um, in fact, Componentality's OpenWave is based on OpenWRT. And that is in a Git repo that you can pull. So a little bit more now about the field trials. These are really large, significant programs. Safety Pilot, Ann Arbor, Michigan, that John alluded to. SimTD, which took place uh, mostly in Frankfurt. There's also a very interesting pilot in the Netherlands called Smart in Car. And uh, Britain has just announced that British Telecom will start a pilot on uh, a road there that is actually going to use the 700 megahertz uh, white space spectrum. So there's a lot of activity going on, and governments and transit agencies and regulatory bodies are really very interested. So let's get into the details here. Safety Pilot uh, has been primarily a vehicle to vehicle trial. That is the emphasis in North America. It just uh, ended its first phase in August. Uh, there's an extension that is going to collect more data from commercial vehicles for another six months. It's a fairly significant program with 2,800 vehicles from seven automakers. Um, 64 of the vehicles were really special instrumented and created for this test. There were 300 vehicles with aftermarket uh, DSRC receivers, and the rest of the vehicles only had beacons. Uh, there was a National Transportation Safety Board report uh, kind of praising this trial uh, that came out last summer and uh, saying that National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, should consider rulemaking. Um, and uh, we're thinking that a notice of proposed rulemaking from NHTSA uh, is uh, probably uh, on the table. Uh, NHTSA is under some pressure because of the FCC uh, activities that uh, John was referring to regarding the spectrum. I'll 
turn now a little bit to the SimTV pilot in Germany, uh, which was running around Frankfurt. Unlike uh, Safety Pilot, it has more of an emphasis on vehicle and infrastructure. A lot of the large automakers were involved in that trial. There were fewer vehicles, but there was really extensive data collection over 18 months. And Europe has a very ambitious plan to actually create what they're calling a cooperative ITS corridor between Rotterdam and Vienna on a main highway. Uh, it would be first in commercial vehicles, and would include these two uh, types of DSRC uh, uh, messages, uh, roadworks warning and detection of traffic conditions. And here, just quickly, since we're running out of time, is an architecture diagram for SimTV. Uh, SimTV has vehicle to vehicle in it, but the emphasis is really on vehicles commuting to, communicating to infrastructure, which is connected to a central station that's monitoring traffic flow and um, uh, perhaps you know, adjusting signal timings or metering lakes uh, in order to improve uh, matters there. So there, while in, for the large part, the protocol stacks, as John described, are compatible between Europe and the US, uh, in detail, um, the emphasis of the programs is a little bit different, which just reflects the fact that uh, Europe is a lot more densely populated, and infrastructure potentially has a, a larger payoff. So in the near future, as I said, the major um, developments that are expected are the actual installation of uh, the uh, corridor between Vienna and Rotterdam. Uh, you know, treaties are being signed and, and things like that in the EU to make that happen. Uh, there was just a government accounting office evaluation of uh, VE to X uh, here in the U.S. last month, uh, which uh, made some cautions about cost. Um, I am actually personally rather optimistic about cost because I really do think that individual drivers would pay an additional fee to have features like green light, optimal speed advisory, but maybe I'm wrong about that. But NHTSA has gathered this information from GAO, from NTSB, and has some pressure on it from FCC. And uh, I, I believe that uh, they will probably be making an announcement shortly, which will really increase activity in this field in the future. So messages I basically want to leave you with uh, before we run out the clock here. Uh, I should say that uh, I'm going to have to change computers when uh, we hit 9 o'clock, but uh, I will go to back onto the uh, chat for the page and answer any more questions. Um, so I just want to say that uh, clearly the vehicle uh, communication, vehicular networking, is a key enabler of autonomous navigation. And all the major automakers have pilot programs on uh, V2X communication. So it really is a lot of activity. Uh, there's clearly an enormous potential to reduce the number of accidents. Just the real-time collision warnings, uh, I think, make this technology worth consideration. And the benefits to the improvement of traffic flow with uh, uh, protocols like cooperative adaptive cruise control or platooning, as it might more uh, obviously be called, you know, have real promise. Um, there really are big opportunities, uh, not only around the actual gadgets like the 802.11p radios, but for collaboration around software for implementation of all these standards that John talked about, for the most part, in Linux, uh, where I work, uh, there are not uh, uh, proofs of conference, uh, 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 proofs of concept or uh, reference implementations of most of these. And Componentality uh, in Finland uh, is the first uh, company to put some software out there. Uh, they want to be the blue Z, if you want to put it that way, of, uh, of WAVE. Um, but beyond the, you know, the uh, software and hardware in the cars, the uh, possibility for big data analytics and backhaul is, is really significant here. Um, there's extensive government involvement interest, and now is a great time to get involved. And uh, as I said, unfortunately, right now all these hyperlinks are bad, but uh, I think John and I recommend these two books, which are really excellent. Uh, there's any number of mailing lists, uh, websites, 
uh, that you can read up about. There's a giant new uh, slide set about safety pilot, for example. Uh, the two, these two uh, uh, websites are really excellent sources of news. My slides will be on SlideShare, and everything will be on Metro's webpage. So with that, I am going to uh, dedicate the remaining couple minutes to uh, allow for questions. I think I've turned my SlideShare off. Yeah, Allison, we can see you. Thanks. Very good. Uh, we did have another question come in from Jonathan uh, regarding Wi-Fi. Um, this, John, this was during your presentation. Uh, do you think that, that this share with Wi-Fi devices, 802.11ac, will change the business model? Does it mean that Wi-Fi devices will be able to send basic safety message? If yes, it opens the market to handheld devices and could be a game changer. Well, let's, I'm not sure if I understand the full dimension of that, but it, Wi-Fi devices per se will not be sending basic safety messages. Um, the basic safety messages will be sent by DSRC devices, but um, there could be a chipset in a smartphone that has both DSRC and Wi-Fi capability. It could be integrated into the same chipset. So, um, so in that sense, yes, handheld devices could be participating in sending BSMs and, and receiving BSMs and, and helping it uh, with uh, helping with safety they, you know that that could help pedestrians and bicyclists and road workers and, and, and so forth there are a lot of interesting proposals as well to implement functionality like street lights that stay off until vehicles or pedestrians uh, approach and one way to enable that would be uh, clearly through motion detectors but you also could have uh, uh, that type of functionality turned on with uh, you know, a, a handheld device. Um, there are a lot of really fascinating proposals, for example, by local various startup Streetline to have the traffic light over a, uh, or, or in road light uh, next to an open parking space on a block that's otherwise full blink. Uh, particularly if a person reserves a parking space in the future via some online application. And so all that kind of uh, functionality could be enabled by handheld devices receiving uh, such messages. Uh, there, there's also the possibility of warning pedestrians that uh, they're about to step in front of a car. Um, and I've even heard a proposal from, from BMW to uh, hunt the horn of a car, approaching car automatically when it senses a pedestrian in front of it without the driver having to intervene. So uh, I don't really know what's going to happen with all these technologies, but you can see why there's so much opportunity because no one really knows what way they're going to go. Thanks, guys. A couple more questions. Um, does the ISO 26262 initiative affect connected car development? How do you see that affecting things moving forward? Um, is I'm not sure if is is two six two six two the functional safety. Uh, That's right. Um, well, yeah, I, I know that there are analyses being done of how that affects it. It certainly does affect it, and 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 each car company is probably doing that kind of analysis. I know in, in Toyota, that's uh, that's a that's something that we have people looking at. Um, so, uh, but I but I'm not part of that. I don't think I can say any more. But it, it definitely is. It definitely has a role. Uh, one more question from Raju Kundi. Apologies if I mispronounced the name. What would be the overhead added or reduced by 1609.2 to the message compared with the conventional PKI? Um, so I'm not sure what he means by conventional PKI, but I can tell you, I can say something about the overhead that comes from uh, from from using authentication according to 1609.2. So we attach a digital signature and we attach a certificate. Um, or if a certificate has previously been used, um, it, we can attach a, a digest of that certificate. If we're attaching the full certificate and the signature, I think the current estimates are that that would take on the order of 130 bytes, which is certainly non-trivial. That would be that that would be more than a third and less than a half of the entire uh, bandwidth consumed by um, by a, a basic safety message. Um, if we send the digest, then it, that comes down to about 40 bytes. Um, so uh, it depends on which. We're still debating whether that digest idea is worth 
if the bandwidth savings that it represents is worth some extra latency if, if you don't have the certificate yet. But th that's the high level answer, somewhere between 130 and 40. Excellent. Uh, one last question from Jonathan Petit. Any clue about the frequency of pseudonym change in the U.S.? Um, so we're, we're, we're working closely with the Europeans uh, on that as well. I think we, we settled er, relatively early on a five-minute pseudonym change, partly based on the idea that we, we wanted you to be using a different certificate at the end of your trip than you were using at the beginning of your trip, just to make tracking destinations from sources um, difficult to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, that's probably going to be left up to each auto manufacturer to do the swapping uh, as they see fit. But it'll, something on the order of, of a few minutes is probably safe to assume. Excellent. Looks like that's it for our Q&A, and we're, we're a few minutes past our, our hour a lot of time, so I think it's probably time to wrap this up. Um, so Dr. John Kinney and Allison Chaikin, thanks again, both of you guys. You did a great job in this presentation. It's been great to have you to discuss this. Um, thanks a lot, you guys. Uh, for the folks watching on our event page, we'll have the full recording of this live YouTube Hangout posted on this page shortly. Uh, and, and we'll also post links to John and Allison's slides. So thanks, you two. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.